Welcome to Book Lore Productions Book Club Night podcast, brought to you by me, Jen from Book Lore Productions. And me, Heather, from Follow Along Blog. July's book was Alexander Hamilton by Ron Chernow. And due to our Hamiltonian ambition... Uh, nice word. <laughs> thank you. Um, we, um, we had a 700-page book this month. So we've decided that when we got to the middle part of it, that we had so much to talk about in the beginning, we decided to split it up into several podcasts. And I'll be the first to admit, and probably not the last to admit, Definitely that not. I did not finish the book as much as I wanted to. It's hard to finish such a long book when you've got tagalongs jumping all over you and a brand new library card burning a hole in my wallet. Me either. And so we are testing out various methods to uh, bring you book club and we want to ensure that everyone enjoys the reading and discussing of these book club nights, books. <laughs> <laughs> and if you have any questions or comments, please feel free to tweet us at book, book Lord Jen and H Higgins 428 on Twitter. Or just head on over to the booklorproductions.com and leave us a comment. Uh, we'd love to hear you from you on the forum or um, even on YouTube where these videos are posted. So All right. we'll there's go. various social media that you can um, <clears throat> contact us through. So now I guess without further delay, we'll start our Alexander Hamilton book club night. And without another take. Yes. All right, Miss Jen, would you like to start us out on our prologue? Yes. Okay, so the prologue is the oldest revolutionary war widow. And that kind of struck me as uh, odd. I was like, okay, so is Eliza Hamilton really the oldest revolutionary war widow? Or is this just an attention grabbing title? Well, it turns out, after a little bit of research, that it's the latter, as pension claims paid in 1906 show that the 106-year-old Esther Damien, who married a Noah Damien, he was 75, she was 21, insert creep factor and Anna Nicole joke here, um, <laughs> the... Um, but the interesting thing that I was kind of like, circle of life, Lion King, um, the Department of Treasury was the one that paid the claim. So that was the cabinet that Alexander helped to establish and set up the infrastructure for. Yes, a man of many accomplishments, Alexander Hamilton. It was not the biggest, nor was it low only accomplishment that he had in his long life. Eliza did everything she could to protect his legacy and his memory. Yes. And it talked about how she outlived her husband by half a century. Can you imagine that? No. If I outlived Philip by that long, I think I'd go crazy. I think she might have been a little bit, you know, just Maybe it was a little bit of old ageness, but, you know, talking. Um, they mentioned at dinner parties, she just was like, I can't wait to see Hamilton. Can't wait to see Hamilton. So she was definitely ready to die. Yes. And her protection over her husband's legacy and memory kind of explains the biographer's bias. When you read the story, you can definitely tell not the story, but the biography, you can definitely tell that Ron Chernow has a soft spot for Hamilton and his entire family. He's not one to say anything wrong. And even when he Hamilton. does point out these faults, uh, it's like these faults are um, their ways to convey things that Hamilton has done. Uh, yeah. He turns them into positive affirmations, basically. Yeah. 
which I, I'd love someone to turn my thoughts into positive affirmations. I mean, Amen to that. Um, <clears throat> another little thing that I thought about while reading it, um, it talks about how President Theodore Roosevelt, Teddy Roosevelt, woo-woo, uh, <laughs> was the, said that Alexander was the most brilliant statesman. And if you think about it, um, I kind of noticed a theme about how politics makes strange bedfellows. It's all throughout his uh, biography. And so you've got this very conservative president in Theodore Roosevelt. And he was known for his love of literacy and self-improvement like Hamilton. And he read books every day. He set up our national park. Uh, or expanded our national park rather, uh, set up in acting uh, protection and conservation of historical sites so that places like Alexander's home could be a historic site. And, um, and here he is calling this man uh, who by all accounts seems to be very liberal in his views. He was an abolitionist and he wanted a central bank and he wanted a central government. And when everyone else, all the conservatives were like, whoa, 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 what's up here? What are you doing? No, no, let's not do that. Back up. Hold that horse. Um, Rewind. Pause that. <laughs> uh, so, I was like, wow, that's kind of interesting there. And um, then he talks, uh, uh, Chernow talks about how um, earlier generations of biographers had to rely on only a meager portion of Hamilton's voluminous output. And we say voluminous because he goes on to tell us how many letters and correspondences this man wrote over the period of his life and it's just like well wow. if you think about it that'd be like saving everybody's texts emails phone calls because they had to write everything but it's the fact they do that now oh well, they might and they say might be watching us at the moment i've got nothing to hide that's right except a cat but <laughs> um it's just the way Hamilton wrote, wrote. He was very flowery. He, he was very flowery and witty and very intelligent. He absorbed everything that he read and could recall it, which I will not lie. I cannot do. I have to read something several times before I'm able to recall it. Again, I'm going to blame the Tagalongs for that. Mommy brain being what it is. I think it's just our short attention spans. Because I'm the exact same way. I don't know. When we were planning this out, you did way better at remembering facts and names than I was. Of course, I should probably just pick a name out of the hat because everybody, almost everybody has the exact same name. There Peter, were at least and three. James, yes. or John. Or, or Peter. There were several Peters. Or how about that Lawrence and Laurels? Yes. No. Yeah. Yes. And Lafayette. He was actually an original. All the Frenchmen yes. were originals. Yes. Getting off track. Let's bring it back. Okay. So um, um, we were talking about his voluminous output. Yes. And how it's um, more accessible nowadays. And do you think that's because of the internet and how libraries have started um, digitizing their papers and their rare documents so that you can be able to search these and find these things out. Um, like, for example, right now, the Hamilton, um, Alexander Hamilton's papers and all um, have a display on in the New York Public Library. Um, and they have listed, the list is uh, inclusive, but it lists several things like the letter that sparked the Burr controversy that led to the um, duel. I guess Burr controversy? Yeah, Aaron Burr. Yeah. I have to say, I, that was as much as he is mentioned in this book from the very beginning. 
I feel like that was a, that letter was the straw that broke the camel's back, to be honest. Yeah. It's just that last, last little pour and just put him over the edge. He was like, we're not gonna take it. There was definitely bad blood. I mean, that Taylor Swift, Swift song, <laughs> T-Swizzle. I was so going there. What it's about. She can feel that duel. Yes. She would totally understand it. And we won't sing that one just in case, you know, it gets pulled. Hey, look. We could. I could just get one of the tagalongs to sing it. It's one of their <laughs> favorite songs. We were rocking out to it earlier. And uh -huh. when Violet sings it, she sings it with some. She's feeling some bad blood towards somebody. I'm just hoping it's not me. She's got plans about that nap time, huh? Because she means it, man. She means it. Anyway. So, um... I don't know if it's accessible because of the internet or because he is such a prominent figure. I feel like even if we didn't have the internet, his works would be copied and copied and almost be accessible in every library. If they, you know what I mean? Like if a yeah. library was offered, hey, would you like this copy of all of Alexander Hamilton's works ever? It'd You're be like, not going yeah. to turn it down. No, you would never turn that down. If somebody personally offered that to me, be like, thank you. I will take that right now. Okay, so do you feel that he's so well known today because of the recent resurgence with the musical and this autobiography um, in the telling of his life? And that do you feel that Eliza uh, wish that justice be done for the memory of her husband has been accomplished? Is there still more to do or was it already done? I think it's at this point, I think it's done. He's the play has done him a great service. Not saying that I paid the $700 to go see the play, but I think it's been done. The um, writers of the play, I've only heard good things about Hamilton. And even this book, even though it's kind of crazy and it jumps around a lot, it's a good book. Despite the fact that I can't get through it yet, it's still a good read. Yes. I would continue reading it even if we weren't going to split it up into multiple podcasts. Because we have to know how it ends. Well, we do. And even we, kn though I we know how it ends, but... I did that mm. research project on Aaron Burr. And at the time, I, did, I mean, I didn't really care who won the duel because I had no... I didn't have a dog in that fight. I, reading this book, I'm starting to feel that bias for Alexander Hamilton, especially learning about his early life and all of his struggles growing up. Like, he did not let a little bit of what seemed like, I don't know, constant bad luck and things that would have caused me to fall into a major depression if I were him. Like, he did not let that stuff stop him. He just kept going forward. So I think the book and the movie, not the movie, the book and the play would- Broadway. Yes, Broadway. He's become a Broadway star. I think it has done him a great service from his humble beginnings on Broadway to Broadway. Yes. A little bit poetic. Um, well, see, I was kind of, I was thinking that there's still more to be done. And the reason being is because, you know, his original biography that his son came out with after his mother, uh, after Eliza's death. Um, Did he ever finish that? He did I, finish it. Okay. I was just wondering if I had missed it or something. Um, he finished it, but it was after Eliza's death. And his sister was all mad at him because it was like, you didn't finish this when our mother was alive? I mean, <laughs> come on now. Sibling um, rivalry. Right. He would have found something to pick on anyway. Exactly. 
And um, so I was, uh, and you know, they we were having the controversy with the ten dollar bill taking his picture off of the ten dollar bill, and it's almost like every couple of generations needs to be reminded of who he was and what he did and how he helped set up the American government. I feel like if you took him off of our money, it would be blasphemy. Because he's the one that set that up. Exactly. He set it I'm up. He needs His face needs to be on the $10 bill, correct? You just said that? Yes. That's what I thought. I'm getting distracted by a cat that's chasing her tail. I'm sorry. Well, while you're distracted by that castaway, let's move on to chapter one and the castaways. Which has to be, so far, the longest chapter in this book. And probably one of the most confusing chapters in this book. I know. I definitely had to reread this chapter a couple of times. And it was like, okay, so we're in Nevis? No, we're in St. Croix. No, we're back in Nevis. Wait, what year is it? And it's Christian land. And it's and which Anne are we talking about? Because I'm pretty sure there were three. At and, least. and the Peters. And the Peters. And the Jameses. Seniors and oh goodness. Yes. Um, so we um just a little background. So Nevis is listed as his birthplace, Alexander Hamilton's birthplace, and it's a small island located east and to the southeast of Puerto Rico. Um, and St. Croix, where you would say that he grew up, um, became part, is part of today's U.S. Virgin Islands. Um, it's an unincorporated territory, and it only has fundamental rights they're really? not afforded that's right they're not afforded the same rights that we have here in the continental united states interesting it is um and it's uh, located 152 miles from nevis and he kind of just made it sound like they picked up and uh packed up and went to the other island and Oh, no, it, it had to be a journey at 152 miles um, northwest of Nevis. And it's like 65 miles southeast of Puerto Rico. Oh, yeah. They, he, the way he talks about travel in this book makes it sound like it took it was, no time to get from like New York New City. Angle, yeah, from New York City to Princeton, Princeton or to even Boston like he jumps around all over the place and you're like I know it takes longer than a day but I guess given the situation Hamilton will ride all day and all night right um, but and St. Croix is 1680 miles southeast of New York City so Hamilton had to go 1,680 miles to get by, to New York. By boat. But uh, that's, that's the interesting thing. He didn't start in New York. He started in Boston. He worked yeah. for this, um, this company, Krieger and Kirk, 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 I mess his name up every single time. Kirkwright, Kruger, Kruger yes. and Kruger yeah, and Kirkwright, which used to be what it was at Beecham. Yes. I want to say. Yes. But if we go back to the start, all of Alexander Hamilton's life started with like his mother. His very like you can draw a line straight from almost every action that Hamilton makes in his life to his mother. You can, there's no denying, there's no way he could be like, oh yeah, I'm totally adopted by Rachel. No, she is, all of his stubbornness, his strong will, his way with, of not letting things get him down comes from his mother and how she dealt with her crazy ex-husband. Um, her crazy ex-husband, Levine, Levine, 
Yeah. How did you say? Johan. Johan. I do not, I did not remember his first name, but he was a very controlling and very manipulative man who was not, let me be clear, was not Alexander's husband, not husband, was not his father, but he did father Alexander's half brother, Peter, before Rachel, his mother, up and left, ran away from home because she could not take it anymore, despite the fact that she would probably like her whole reputation would be smeared and she would live with the name whore. I hate to go blue on you guys, but or on the street, otherwise known as a hoe. Yep, <laughs> she lived with that. Thankfully, she was able to escape to a different island, which, as Jen earlier mentioned, was a good distance apart and was able to find a new husband, common law husband, mind you. She was not allowed to get married after she officially divorced Levine, Levine, whatever his last name is. All right. Just tell it like it is. She shacked up with this guy. She did. She shacked up with James Hamilton Sr. And they had two kids. Yes. James Jr. and Alex. They were two years apart, Alexander being the younger. And actually, James Hamilton, you would think, would have had this fantastic life because he was Scottish royalty, basically. He was one of, what, 12? 11 or 12? A, a, a large family. Yes, he was from a large family, the Hamiltons. He was his father was um, a Scottish laird. Yes, a Scottish a Scottish laird had a castle and everything. Yes, and all of his brothers and sisters did very well. James, though, was not as lucky. That's Hamilton's dad, by the yes. way. Not brother. James. Yes, James Senior was not as lucky. All of his brothers and sisters went on to be fairly successful and lived a cushy life. I mean, as far as you know, life was in seventeen seventy something. Because his birthday, Hamilton was kind of. Oh, I don't want to call him a woman, but he kind of fudged his birthday a little bit in some period in some at some time point in his life in order to I don't know not gain control what would the word be uh influence appearances yes influence appearances so he uh, go ahead oh uh to me it seemed like he learned um when he came to America that in appearances were really, really important. How you dressed, how you walked, how you talked, um, more so than it was in St. Croix. And it's just, um, he learned this valuable lesson. Um, about appearances. He was all about appearances when you're an illegitimate because his parents were not married. James and Rachel were, were not married. He and they was couldn't all, get married. They could not get married. You were correct. They could not get married. He was all about appearances. He very rarely, if ever, mentioned the fact that he was an illegitim illegitimate son because his parents never got married. And eventually his dad, amongst rumors that his mother had various affairs and that she was a whore let's a, whore. a loose woman a loose a woman of loose morals that's it um there was a question of alex's paternity although people around him just assumed that james was his father still but that gave james Junior, James Sr., an excuse to up and run uh, off. Yes. That and the fact that he was not a good businessman, like most of the people in 
Alexander Hamilton's life. The man in tr who helped create the Treasury Department, the people around him growing up were, were horrible business people. Horrible. Almost everybody failed except for his mother. Again, his mother, this wonderful, crazy woman of loose morals, apparently, was the only person who had a head for business in his young life. And let's talk about that mother. She was jailed. Sent uh, her uh, husband, um, Johan, yeah. had her jailed for adultery. Man, I know some women nowadays who would love that. If they could say, oh, well, he cheated on me. Twice. Twice. Apparently, the uh, the law was that if you were no longer living with your husband or wife, but there were two instances of adultery that could be hinted at or known, proven, um, you could jail your spouse. Those instances have names now. Their names are Alex and James. Yes. <laughs> So, um, but she didn't let this thing. get, yeah, but she didn't let that get her down. She was, a, like I said before, she's a very strong willed woman. And much of his life growing up, like after his dad left, I don't remember how many years. Do you know how many years after when he and his mother got ill? I want to say it's within one or two years. She was um, a successful grocer, grocer for a couple of years, but she was kind of flaky, so she would be successful and then she would up and move. And in this time, she switched islands also. So she went back to Nevis, correct? Yes. yes. She went back to St. Croix. Okay. So um, she was on St. Croix and she up and left Lavian with Peter. Without um, Peter. Yeah. Lavian had Peter and moved to Nevis. And then Lavian moves to the far side of St. Croix and dabbles in real estate. Which he so, feels that. Yeah. He just seemed like a speculator to me. Um, and then Peter up and moves to South Carolina. You've heard South, South Carolina, which is like maybe 45 minutes away from me. Nice, beautiful town. Anyway, go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> and in the meantime, James leaves uh, Rachel. And Rachel is summoned back to St. Croix. And, or did, no, they're summoned back to St. Croix because James and Rachel, James had a job in St. Croix. And so they had to give up all pretense that uh, they were a married couple. Yes. She was no longer hidden under the name Mrs. Hamilton. She had to go back to either her maiden name or her previously married name. Um, and that's when James junior and alexander were thrust into reality of being illegitimate sons which they did not have to deal with back in their hometown their home island whatever yeah. you want to call it but she was fairly successful despite her reputation yes it says um, um page 22 that she had a little um store that sold foodstuffs to planters, salted fish, beef, pork, apples, butter, rice, and flour. And how, and he mentions how uncommon it was for a woman to be a shopkeeper. Yes. And it's successful. I cannot say the word now. Especially. Successful shopkeeper. Awesome. Because from what I hear, she had a good rapport with everyone. Yeah. The, Again, uh, despite the her reputation. Kruger and Beekman. 
Yes. Uh, and you would think that maybe kind of that's how uh, Hamilton got his first job was through her, his mother's business connections with Beekman and Kruger. Yes. And his older brother did not. Apparently, from what I've read in this biography, he just did not have the head for business. And instead of being, I would say, greedy, like his the people surrounding him, he instead decides, after his mother's death, to go into carpentry, which is not usually something a white person would go into. But because he knew that he did not have the head for business. And instead of failing, he decided to do what was best for him. And as far as we know, he was successful in that because after his mother's death, Alexander and his brother kind of parted ways. They kept in touch, but not they were not extremely close. And that's the same as, that's the same for their dad because Alexander kept in touch with his dad, but they, again, were not very close. They didn't really keep in touch. I mean, he knew his brother was on the island because, uh, remember, later in the book, it tells us that he writes his brother and it says, I don't even know if you're married. I don't even know if dad's still living. Um, and at this point, he's, uh, he's married Eliza. And it's like, oh, we didn't even invite dad to the wedding, didn't invite the brother to the wedding. So he was the only family member for his side of the family. Yes, but there was so much tragedy in that family because <sighs> at the age of 10, Alexander being 10 and James Jr. being 12, both Alexander and his mother, Rachel, became very, very ill with a fever and Rachel actually passed away in the bed next to Alexander while Alexander was still trying to recover from this fever, which obviously he did eventually get better, but he'd still not be in the best shape for like the rest of his life. He was still prone to illnesses after, after this. I mean, I could not imagine being in the bed next to me as my mother died. Like I would not know what to do. Again, it, he's, and it said that at nine o'clock at night, these um, these lawyers from the town come in and just kind of seal up the whole house and the yard and everything except for the little attic where a, you would think that the dead mother's body is still laying in bed next to Alexander because, you know, they've sealed everything up, but they're not carting off her body to um, for anything. And then they just come in and make lists of what is in the apartment and sell it off. Yep. And again, Alex and his brother were 10 and 12. Could you imagine being 10 and 12 and having to deal with such a big blow? Because again, James's fa their father did not come back and rescue them. Be like, Oh, you're my sons. I'm going to take care of you. No, there was nobody came right away to take care of them until Peter Linton came and decided to be their guardian. But this did not go very well for the boys, for the Hamilton boys. Uh, the other thing that struck me kind of interesting about this is how uh, Chernow says it all kind of happened so quickly that they came in at nine o'clock at night and within like a week or two, everything was over and done with. Well, if you've ever had to, um, for any reason, had a close death in your family and have to go through the court system, nowadays it takes months in order yes. to get everything settled. But this was like over and done with within a short period of time. Oh, yes. They definitely did not worry about anybody's feelings getting hurt. There was no child protective services to look after these boys who were not men yet. They weren't even teenagers, really. They were in their teens, technically, but not really teenagers. Yeah. What was he, 14 years old and working at the, um, clerking at, um... No, he wasn't even that yet. Because at the age that, oh, wait, yes. Yes. Never mind. He was 14. Yes, because he was already clerking at... 
Kruger and Beekman. Yes. Oh, goodness. And then he spaced, they stayed with their... Peter Linton, their cousin. Was it the cousin? It was a cousin. Their, their relations are so confusing. Yes. Their cousin, Peter Linton, which was obviously on their mother's side. After their father left, he had little to no contact with his father's side. I do believe Hamilton wrote them a letter when he was in his 30s. But what came of that, I'm not sure. But not long after Peter decided to take care of James Jr. and Alexander, he had a string of business failures and by what his brother had said, had become a little bit insane. And he also had a child with a black woman, which would have been a scandal at that point because they were still slaves and the black woman would have been a slave. Um, after the business failings and everything, he changed his will and then prompt, I don't want to say promptly, to me in the book, the way the timeline is written, he promptly killed himself right after he changed his will. Yeah. And in his will, he does not take care of the Hamilton boys. James Jr. and Alexander are left with nothing once again because after their mother died, their half-brother Peter came in and was the only one who could inherit anything because James, James Jr. and Alexander were illegitimate. They could not claim anything of Rachel's. And Peter was so bitter that he took everything and went back to South Carolina. Okay, so if you're wondering uh, how Lin Peter Linton figures into all this, James and Alexander's mother, Rachel, had a sister who survived, and her name was Anne. Well, Anne married James Linton, and James Linton had, they, uh, Anne and James Linton had a son, and they named him Peter. So Peter becomes the custodian of him, and their uncle James, who at one point was fairly well off, um, but then they talk about him, is, uh, the whole Linton family escaping South Carolina uh, with um, like a, a boatload of slaves and um, having debtors come after them and all. Um, so that was kind of interesting. But James Linton died, his uncle, Alexander's uncle, died a month after Peter had died. But there's apparently another uncle, and he's the one that's like, James was completely cray-cray. <laughs> Don't know why we haven't uh, um, insane asylumed him. I guess he was just only a little crazy. He was a functional cray cray. That's you right. know many people like that. Uh -huh. We all have those moments. Yes, we do. And um, so instead of um, this other cousin taking them in, he's taken in by this man named Stevens. Thomas Stevens, which was a uh, respected merchant and his wife, Anne. And um, Hamilton becomes like be best childhood friends with their son, Edward Stevens. And it broaches this topic about is Hamilton, Alexander Hamilton, really a Hamilton? Or is he a Stevens? Because Edward Stevens and Alexander, and, and Alexander Hamilton look so much alike that people often mistook them for one another. Which I think is a little funny. When I first moved to Savannah, I have to say that I had many doppelgangers running around the city. Several times I had friends come up to me going, I saw you over here and I waved at you and you didn't wave back. And I was like, I was not there. That was not me. That was my doppelganger. And I actually saw her one day, and we had these same colored glasses, which were red-rimmed, and we were wearing the exact same hoodie at the time. 
I was so freaked <laughs> out I had to laugh. I had to leave because what do you do in that situation when you find your twin? Like, and you weren't expecting it. Um, but Edward Stevens, and if you've noticed throughout the book, whenever they mention that Alexander finds a best friend, a BFF, they're always fast friends. There, whenever he finds a soulmate, a bro soulmate, it's always fast friends. Yes, like his bromances both. are are legendary, and they are. Like yes. Um, so do you think that the truth of Alexander's paternal parentage is what James, uh, prompted James Hamilton to leave or was he just a deadbeat dad? I, to weigh my personal opinion in, I would say to blame parentage would give James too much credit. I do believe that it's probably a deadbeat dad situation. Because even if, I don't know, to me it just seems like a deadbeat dad situation. I feel like yeah, like um, today, there's no way that it's Steven biology mother, versus the guy that raised you. Yes. And well, if, if Ann Stevens, correct? Yes. I'm just going to assume her because everybody's name is Ann except for Rachel. Um, Ann Stevens. And you're right. I, I, I would have a extremely hard time with my husband's love child coming to live with me. That's my personal opinion and that has no factual basis on what actually happened in Alexander's life. But since we don't have Alexander here to question him about his paternity. So you I'm, would totally be Caitlin Stark. Caitlin Stark. I feel like I should know this reference. Game but of I, Thrones. Um, and see, I started Game of Thrones. It's so hard to watch with kids. I can't watch it. Because they're always like peeking over my shoulder. What you watching, Mommy? What you watching? Nothing what? you can watch. Nothing. Look away. Look away. But I would say that he's a deadbeat dad. Because otherwise... It, I mean, really, the paternity thing is an excuse. He was a failure as a, as a provider, which was a big thing back then. Um, and he probably felt that. But if he'd left his family and kind of did what Rachel did, which is leave your family, you pretend like you have no ties to anyone, you can kind of start over. He continued to fail after that, but you can start over. Except now, in this day and age, there's no starting over. There Everything is. you put on the internet follows you. Yes. Like this podcast. Here's hoping people like it. And if not, we'll be in a hurricane of our own. And that brings us now to Chapter 2, The Hurricane. The Hurricane. Yes, this was a very monumental point. It was a turning point. And young Alexander Hamilton's life. It's it's one of those moments that define your character um, in your life. We've all have those moments, and for him, it was the hurricane. Yes, the hurricane that hit Saint Croix mm -hmm. and prompted Alexander to write a letter to his friend and mentor Hugh Knox, who was remind me again, Jen. Hugh Knox was the um, the cleric uh, on St. Croix, and he was also um, a um, editor at the local newspaper. Yeah. And Alexander wrote him this beautiful letter, according, of course, to Hugh Knox. And Hugh convinced him to allow him to post the letter in the local paper, which Alexander agreed to. And he, that is the start of basically the rest of his life. That one letter about this one hurricane 
catapulted this young man into what would be a lifelong legacy. Because yeah. most of his legacy has to do with his, with the written word. He was such an eloquent writer and an eloquent, eloquent storyteller. And let's not forget, he was a poet. And, and we he, didn't even know it. We didn't, but he did. He was very aware of it. And actually, as I was reading, and I'm going to bring it back to the prologue for just a second. Sure. As I was reading this, rereading it to make sure I didn't miss anything, I did find out that I missed something. The author, Ron Chernow, mentions, let me see, make sure I get this word for word. There is a very apt description of Alexander. I'm upset with myself now because I feel like I did not underline it like I would have. It had to do with the type of person that Alexander became when he was older. Oh, so annoyed with myself right now. Have you ever had this happen to you? Oh, um, it was talking about um, Hamilton grew up in a tropical hellhole of dissipated whites and fractitious slaves, all framed by a background of luxuriant beauty in nature. And so for me, uh, this dispelled any illusions of beauty. He seemed really, um, I don't think verbose is the word. Um, he seemed real jaded. Yes, very jaded. Yes, he was very jaded towards slaves themselves because when Rachel's mother died, she, Rachel then inherited not just a little bit of money, but she inherited slaves as well. And one of those, two of the slaves actually came to live with the Hamilton children. Ajax was, Hamil was Alexander's personal slave as a child, and he began to humanize him which would later affect him when he was a cleric for what was probably now Kruger and Courtright. Courtright. And he, when I think I want to say Courtright left on a trip, he, Hamilton himself, Alexander himself, I don't want to get confused with any other Hamilton. Yes. Uh, in, uh, 19, uh, excuse me, 1769, David Beekman quit the business and was replaced by Cornelius Courtright, another New Yorker with a prestigious name. Uh, the firm was reconstructed to Courtright and Kruger, and in October of 1771, for medical reasons, Nicholas Kruger returned to New York for a five-month stint leaving his precocious clerk in charge, page 31. Yes. Um, and while he was there, he also had to go on to ships and basically take inventory of the slaves upon the ships that were to belong to, that were to be resold, basically. And if you've ever seen any maps of slave ships about how they pack these human beings, it's it's worse than sardines in a can. It's way worse because um, these are living humans. And you've got, they get sick and that sickness just spreads through everything and everyone real quick because they're literally one on top of the other. Uh, they starved them. Um, it said, when a ship docked with 41 skeletal drooping mules, Hamill lectured the vessel skipper um, about the condition that he treated these mules. And he gave this veteran sea, uh, uh, tongue lashing to a veteran sea captain. And here he is talking about the, uh, the, uh, the way he treats these animals. And so... Of course, you think, yeah, he's going to definitely say something, uh, maybe, about how these people are treated. But it was—that's not the first time Hamilton. It's 
well, it is the first time, but it definitely is not the last time Hamilton goes up to a superior, basically, and gives them a tongue lashing about how they were doing their job. If Hamilton felt so there convicted, was a, yeah, he, he felt was that going there to was tell a you way where, to do it better. Yes, he was going to do it. Then you and the way from what. I've gleaned from this book. If Hamilton felt that you were gonna do it better, he's gonna tell you how to do it better. And the way he's gonna tell you is done so beautifully that you are not able to argue back. He was a famed debater. Even in college, which we have not gotten to yet, he was a famed debater. And yes. many people looked up to him for his way with words. And he was driven on by having the position to be opposite. Um, they said he could really hone his position when he had someone to debate against, basically. When he was able to take a stand, a solid stand on something. Yes, and he was a very passionate young man. Very passionate. In everything that he did, there was no... He was definitely not fickle. He was very pugnacious. That's my, that was my always favorite vocabulary word since I was in high school and I learned it. He was a very pugnacious young man. He was looking for a fight. And if you were unfortunate enough to enter a verbal sparring with Alexander Hamilton, you might as well have just given up because you would not win. He, was again a lot like his mother very stubborn and strong-willed his way or the highway exactly and that's what led him into very a lot of leadership positions because even at the age of 18 or so he was left in a very not prestigious so much but a very, he was left with a very important job when one of his bosses went on a trip and he was in charge of taking inventory. He was in charge of part of the company and most men his age, young men his age, would never be in that kind of position. But because he was so charismatic and so, and he carried himself well, they had no doubt that he could do the job well, and he did. He proved them correct. Yes. He never let them see any kind of weakness. Um, not only that, he was able to make currency exchanges. Um, he cataloged and kept meticulous notes. Um, throughout his life. Throughout his life, but... Uh, but this is where it started at um, Courtright and Kruger and um, on the uh, um, available, he became basically a statistician started there. Um, you see it later on when he assumes the mantle of secretary of the treasury where he is definitely a statistician and he has to know everything to figure out how the system of government will work, um, how his vision will work. Um, but the um, interesting thing about this, I thought, is that oh, um, this statistician, um, I lost my thought. <laughs> Oh, it happens to me all the time. Oh, well, we'll come back to it. I'll have it later. It's fine. All of this led to... Oh, his um, wanting to become a man of letters. So his want, uh, need to improve himself constantly. Uh, whether it was reading through his 34 books. I know that doesn't sound like a lot, but... I know that I've got at least 34 in my to-be-read pile. 
Um, and that to be red pile is not all of them have to be here. That's just, you know, Pinterest. Oh, this book looks nice. This book looks nice. I want to check out this book when I go to the bookstore next time. Yes. I can definitely. The library? Oh, here's my waiting to be red pile. Oh, uh, yes. But 34 books, and that doesn't seem like a lot to us. Uh, 34 books may fill up a bookshelf, not bookcase, bookshelf, um, but that's what they had. But imagine having to carry that because as a young man and all these tragedies, he had to move a lot, but he kept those books with him. Um, and also, all of this led up to him His. gaining trust and... Not just trust, but almost older. Yeah. His, not friends, the older mentors. Hugh, like, yes, Hugh, Hugh the Hugh mentor. Knox, like, admired this young man for his able, his ability with words his, and his, his ambition to excel. Yes, his temperament, basically. And Hugh ended up being the chief sponsor of the subscription fund that um, led to um, oh, Alexander going to America. Yes. They say that it was, wasn't just Hugh Knox that sponsored him. It was also... Um, Several shopkeepers from the yeah. island. Yes, well, his bosses from cousin, his past. So, like, his cousin Anne... One of his many, one of the many which, aunts which, in his life. Which was his mother's sister's aunt's daughter, Anne. Yes. And if there was ever a Gilmore Girls reference for Lorelai, that one was it. Yes. Um, <laughs> and so, but all of this came about because of this hurricane. And you, you see how... Alexander's life has been this natural disaster, one after another. The death of his mother, his father leaving, um, not in that order, but and then the disillusionment that his family was a real family, you know. Um, and then that his cousin was killing himself. Yes, his cousin killing himself. Um, that he was wanted, basically. Until the Stevens took him in. And even then, it's like, okay, you've got to have you a job. You, you need to pull your weight around here type thing. Yes, um, even at that point, everybody, at that point, everybody wanted him. Yes. I couldn't imagine leaving such responsibilities to someone so young. Unless you really wanted them there. Well, they also, they, they were expecting him to go to medical school. They were. You were right. Uh, it said that Stevens, Edward, uh, the Edward Stevens, had went to medical school just prior to Alexander being shipped off from to New York or Boston, Boston via New York, <laughs> New York via Boston, rather. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and you're like. So their whole goal maybe in to educate this young man was to have him come back home and treat them because of the scarcity of doctors in this area at this time. And unfortunately for them, Alexander never came back, but he did still have, even after the fun to get him to America ran out, he still had the monthly, I want to say, monthly allowance from his cousin Anne's will because even after Anne Mitchell died he still got money from her estate and that is what basically funded his life as a young adult not that I want any of my cousins or anything to die but that would have been nice as a young adult to have that constant money come in that's beside the point Hey, but I thought she was this, still I thought she was still alive for part of it. For part of it, yes, but when after a while, I think I'm pretty sure she had died and he was still receiving money from her estate. We'll have to double check that fact there. But um 
The other little interesting thing is he didn't send his brother a letter when he got to New York. New York. Um, instead, he sent letters back home. Or they suspect that these were letters sent by Hamilton back home to the newspaper. And my thinking on this is probably he was writing his mentor Knox. And Knox just happened to be the editor, one of the editors over at the newspaper. And, you know, he, here's this guy and he's giving them information about what's going on in the world and what's going on with the revolution. And so, of course, the guy is going to publish this so that he can share it with the other people on his island. Spread the news. Yeah, these were major life events, and if nothing else, it's at least an escape from your own life, because life on those islands was not easy, even if you were white. It was a hard life unless you were extremely successful. The caste system in that community, which also was one of those propelling factors for Alexander, I mean, he didn't want to become either the poor the rich, or bigger plantation owner. Yeah. You were either super rich or super poor. And I wish Alexander had given me some lessons on, um, how to make that dollar stretch. Not just that, but on how in flowery language, because using super twice does not make me feel good about myself. But, <laughs> It Side just added note. duper to the end of one of them. I could have. I could have. And then I could have just been a cartoon character. But I did find that passage that I was looking for. And apparently, much like our author, Ron Chernow, I'm going to leap out of the timeline into further on in the book. Not too much further. It's a page 112. But I feel like it... It still says a lot for his early life and his life in total. For Alexander, it, he wrote, for anyone studying Hamilton's paybook, it would come to no surprise that he would someday emerge as a first rate constitutional scholar because, this is my part, he wrote every, he not only wrote everything down, he remembered everything. An unsurpassed treasury secretary Remember his days as a clerk, he was keeping track of money and he had always had an eye for the finances. Specific, yes, finances. It talks about him lugging this huge voluminous book around the whole Revolutionary War. Oh yeah, it was what, two volumes and he kept it with him the entire time. And the protagonist of the first great sexual scandal in American pol political history, which... To be frank, to I be made fair. me a, a little uncomfortable because he was quite a womanizer. Not just that, but I mean, if you read before they even talk about him being a womanizer, those poems he wrote, one was like, oh, you're my, you're my goddess. I've never hurt you. And the other one kind of degraded the woman. So right. he, he was quite a man, very well-rounded, if you if you would say, much like his mother, at least how they described his mother. Because if you could say the same thing, you could probably say those exact same things about her. Because there's no way she would get through life as just a mother if she didn't pick up things that she saw, if she didn't pick up on her surroundings because she would never have made it as a female grocer otherwise. She would Correct. never have been able to provide for her children or escape her crazy first husband. Oh gosh, he was insane. Like I can't, I can't wrap my head around that. And she was almost sold to him. She was yes. told that she had to marry him. Yes. At sixteen. At sixteen, she Can had you no imagine? Children. I mean, I know my uh, one of my grandparents married at sixteen. My um, my dad's mom married at sixteen. But can you, um, well, actually 15, uh, uh, 15, 16, a little gray area, you know, <laughs> but, uh, because back in those days they could, um, but 
can you imagine being just think back to like the person you were at 15 and 16 can you imagine it being okay this is going to be your husband and you seeing some floppy dandy type person oh really i'm marrying this and it's all heirs like the guy didn't even have any money to his name he just put on some nice clothes and was hi i'm here to dig some gold from you yes and then he basically was mean to her he didn't even try to like woo her or anything he treated her like poo and then she ran away and then he got mad because she ran away i i don't blame her though she could have handled things better after the fact but yes she still raised at least one very influential son so that's batting 50 percent 500 get you in the hall of fame <laughs> Books and we baseball. Might. Books and baseball. That would be that will be my one and only baseball reference. Because while I enjoy watching it sometimes, I can't really get into it. I, I just don't understand. I understand the basic comment, uh, the basic outline of baseball, but anyway. But that leads us to America, and that is where we are going to stop our podcast. Once we get to America, we are stopping because so that is a whole different podcast um so we'll uh hopefully have one up within the next week or two and uh we hope to hear your comments and questions your thoughts about some of the topics that we've discussed and we'll get back with you with answers and remember uh, no trolling that's right um you can hit us up here at the book lore website facebook Twitter, YouTube, Pinterest, um, either We're all with over the place. I know we are, either with Booklore Productions, uh, Booklore Gin, or Follow, follow along, along Blog, which is usually Follow Along BLG or H Higgins 428, which is what I also go by. So on Twitter, I'm very active on Twitter especially during nap times. We'll make sure that there's links posted in the description of this video, at least by tomorrow. Um, and we thank you for your patronage with Book Club Night. And your patience with Book Club Night. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Good night, everybody. Night.